Good afternoon. This is Kim McCleary. Welcome, everyone, to the seventh webinar in our 2010 series. We're delighted to have so many people with us this afternoon. We have about 320 people registered for today's program. Mm -hmm. And um, before I introduce Dr. Lapp, I'd just like to go over a couple housekeeping things because I know about a third of our audience uh, is attending their very first webinar. So to orient folks to uh, the technology and um, just a few procedures, I, I'll just give you a few pointers here at the top. Um, First of all, Dr. Lapp and I, although we are both in Charlotte and we occasionally run into each other in the grocery store, um, right now we are in two different locations. He's at his office and I'm at mine. Um, so we can't see one another. We can't see any of you guys. And you can't see us. So uh, it's a little bit of an odd thing. I think this is, Dr. Lapp, your first webinar to deliver. Is that right? That's correct. So, so we're, uh, he's going to be getting acclimated to the fact that there's no uh, way to judge body language or nonverbal communication from our audience and um, no way for us to know whether you guys are, are bored or um, intent or listening. Uh, so just keep that in mind. We use this tool because it's a great way to get programming out. Um, it is a low cost compared to having a big conference and flying people in, but it is um, a little less than ideal in terms of not being able to have that, that eye to eye contact and person to person uh, interaction. But at any rate, uh, we offered registrants the opportunity to submit questions in advance, and we do have all of those, and uh, I shared them with Dr. Lapp actually late last night. So. He has not had a chance to incorporate those into his program, but many of them, uh, as I had known already, were included in his materials. Um, there will be some time for Q&A after the presentation. On your screen, to the right side of your screen, you should have a little task toolbar area. There's a little place, uh, I think, toward the bottom of, of the little control dials that you can see where you can type questions in. And, what happens to those questions is they come into me, and uh, from what we've found over the last six webinars, many of them are about sort of technical things, how to turn the sound up, uh, and that kind of thing. Um, and others have to do with the topic at hand. Some may be of a more personal nature, so I'll try to screen some of those out, forward them on to Dr. Lapp, and then he and I will have a conversation uh, about those questions, uh, him giving you answers at the end of the program. So hopefully that will uh, that will give us a way to do this um, using this kind of technology. Just one note, Dr. Lapp, although he is a medical doctor, um, the format of these presentations doesn't make it possible for him to address individual questions about different therapies or treatments or medications and dosage, frequency, those kinds of things. So if you could just hold off on those questions, they really aren't, um, this isn't well suited to that type of a, a dialogue. So without further ado, hopefully I won't have some of the problems I've had with slides the last few rounds and I'll be able, oh, now I've lost my mouse. We've been beset with computer problems here in the office today, so I apologize. There we go. Um, hopefully, it won't jump beyond that. Um, today's topic is the stepwise approach that Dr. Charles Lapp uses in treating his CFS and fibromyalgia patients. And as many of you already know from um, the very warm emails we received when, when this particular program was announced, uh, Dr. Lapp is well known. Um, both as a clinician and a speaker and an author um, and an advocate for the CFS and fibromyalgia communities. Um, he practices medicine here in Charlotte at the Hunter Hopkins Center. Um, he has also uh, a practice in Raleigh, North Carolina, and first came to know about CFS when a group of the musicians in the North Carolina Symphony the mill in the mid-1980s at about the same time that the Incline Village and Lindenville uh, outbreaks of CFS were occurring. And he has 
stuck by his patients and stuck by this community for all those many years, and we're so grateful for the many ways in which he has contributed. Uh, Dr. Lapp is a past member of the Federal CFS Advisory Committee. He's also a past board member of the IACFS slash ME, the professional organization that ho holds a conference every two years that many people attend or uh, read the summaries of. Uh, several years ago, he and Dr. Leonard Jason, who was a speaker on one of our most recent webinars, uh, worked together with us to develop a Train the Trainer program where we had a curriculum to teach healthcare professionals how to teach other healthcare professionals about CFS. And uh, Dr. Lapp was a, a favorite presenter for that, that program and, and just taught people a tremendous amount of information that then they passed on to healthcare providers in their areas. He also worked with us and with Dr. Cindy Bateman to create a, a Medscape course on CFS that I think the final numbers came in at about 37,000 healthcare professionals had taken that course. And it is the most widely distributed continuing medical education course on CFS that we're aware of. So without further ado, I am going to turn the controls over to Dr. Lapp and ask him to share with us his approach to treating CFS and FM. Chuck? Thank you very much, Kim. Uh, I appreciate it, and I want to thank you and the CFIDS Association for asking me to present this program, which is an update of a lecture that I originally gave in Nashville, Tennessee, about 10 years ago. So um, I'm trying to get my screen to show up here right now, Kim, and I don't have any of the slides, so let me... It says that I'm launching, but it doesn't give me any of the slides yet. Well, you, you should have your PowerPoint up on your screen. I do not, no. Okay, well, that's what we, that's what we need. Okay, I can do that. <laughs> I thought it came from your side there. Now, that way you can advance uh, at, at will. Exactly. So let me click on that. And there we go. How's that? There's just a bit. So, so um, Perfect. <laughs> Terrific. So I think we are uh, underway now. I just need to click on the screen and get going. Um, what I want to uh, tell everybody is to just sit back and enjoy the program. Uh, there's no necessary to get pens and pencils out and all kinds of scrap paper uh, because uh, the uh, CFIDS Association will publish these slides uh, on the website. You can get them on the website. Uh, and with the PowerPoint slides, there's a note section. And all of the comments that I have will be in those notes section. So uh, uh, if you have any questions about what I said, or if you want to go back at a later time, you can just sit back and enjoy now and just go back to that notes section later on. So, uh, uh, And as Kim just pointed out, if questions do come up, uh, you should have a place on the right-hand bottom side of your screen where you can type in your questions and uh, she will screen them and we'll do a question and answer session at the end. So let me start by saying that uh, we're addressing two relatively new illnesses, uh, chronic fatigue syndrome, um, otherwise known as chronic fatigue immune dysfunction syndrome, otherwise known as myalgic encephalopathy. Uh, and we're also discussing fibromyalgia today. So CFS was described in 1988 for the first time and fibromyalgia in 1990, which is why I consider them relatively uh, new illnesses, if you will. Now, prior to the 1980s, if patients with CFS or FM went to their doctor seeking help for these illnesses, they were thought to be either hypochondriacal or just plain nuts. Uh, and, and most patients ended up being sent to the psychiatrist. Um, what happened in the 1980s, though, was because of the epidemics that occurred, it became clear 
that these patients that they were calling hypochondriacal really all had the same kind of symptoms. And, and eventually there were four cardinal symptoms that evolved that were, were typical of most of the patients that we were seeing at that, at that time. The first was pain, usually in the muscles, but it can be in the joints or it could be just a headache. The second was the cognitive dysfunction, trouble thinking, concentrating, memory, calculation, uh, even confusion and disorientation at times. And the third symptom was the fatigue, which is not just a tiredness or a sleepiness. In fact, it's not a sleepiness at all. It's a total lack of energy, a lack of stamina, uh, and there's a phenomenon the, in this fatigue that we call post-exertional malaise, which means that if you push one day, then you may pay a price for that a day or two or three days down the line. And then lastly, most of our patients had a sleep disorder. They didn't sleep well, but specifically whether they slept four hours or 14 hours, they didn't wake up feeling refreshed or restored. So non-restorative sleep was one of the typical symptoms. Uh, and, and I'm fond of saying the way that I remember these four symptoms is the pain, the brain, the energy drain, and oh, I wish I could sleep again. Now, as we learn more about chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia, we realized that not only did our patients have these four cardinal symptoms, but they were much more likely to have other conditions or overlap syndromes along with that such as irritable bowel and overactive bladder, um, orthostatic intolerance like neurally mediated hypotension, temporal mandibular joint syndromes were, were common in these patients, and the women would get pelvic pain, just aching in the pelvis area, and the men would get a similar sort of thing that was attributed to prostatic problems or prostatosis. And there were at least two dozen more overlap syndromes that we now associate with CFS and FM. Now, just to be clear, I personally consider chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia very much alike, like brother and sister. They share the same symptoms and they share those same overlap symptoms, but they have different definitions, which we'll talk about in just a second. Um, but there are some very fine biochemical and genetic differences between the two. For example, in fibromyalgia, um, neurotransmitters called substance P and glutamate are elevated in the central nervous system, but that's not the case in uh, chronic fatigue syndrome. Uh, and we now know that when you study genomics, when you study the genes of patients with CFS and FM, it's possible to separate patients that have fibromyalgia from those that have pure chronic fatigue syndrome, uh, and the genomes can even reflect the severity of the illness. So there's no test that diagnoses chronic fatigue syndrome. There's no blood test, there's no urine test, there's no x-ray. You have to rely on what's called a clinical case definition. That is, the diagnosis is based on the most common signs and symptoms that we see. I won't provide all of the uh, uh, details about the clinical case definition for chronic fatigue syndrome. Because so many of you are familiar with that, but I will say that an international working group was convened by the CDC in 1988, and they developed a research case definition at that time. Um, that was then improved and republished in 1994, which is the current definition that we're using. Although the definition was developed for research purposes, um, it really has considerable utility for clinicians today, too, in clinical practice. Fibromyalgia on the other hand, um, developed in 1990 when the American College of Rheumatology convened a group of fibromyalgia. To determine the criteria for fibromyalgia, Dr. Fred Wolf and his colleagues studied about 558 patients. About half of them had classical fibromyalgia and the other half were controls that were age and sex matched, but they had neck pain, they had low back pain, they had trauma-related pain syndromes, and some had rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, and other rheumatic conditions. So they compared the two groups. This research group concluded that patients with fibromyalgia for at least three months, and they had at least 11 of 18 tender points. So these tender points were in all four quadrants of the body, above the belt, below the belt, on the right side, 
and the left side. And these patients also had tenderness along the spine, or they had tenderness along the breastbone, what we call axial tenderness. So the American College of Rheumatology criteria are about 88% accurate or specific in determining fibromyalgia from other rheumatological conditions. And 88% accuracy is much better than many blood tests that we have today. So it's an excellent, excellent description. So this brief introduction brings us to the real meat of the talk today, and that is the management of chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia. In 1992, Dr. Paul Cheney and I were working together here in Charlotte, North Carolina, and we felt that there should be some standardized, evidence-based program to manage these debilitating illnesses, uh, which is why we developed the stepwise approach in the first place. And over the years, this program has been widely adapted by many other physicians, and many aspects of the, of the program have been improved and expanded. So today what we're going to be talking about is the new and improved version. We start with education. We still educate our patients here at the Hunter Hopkins Center, one-to-one, -one, face to face, and new patients actually leave the office with a DVD about uh, chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia. They get a binder of pertinent articles as well as a three to six month treatment plan to take back to their primary care physician. But education begins not only with that material, it begins with reassuring a patient that they have a recognized disorder. Most people are relieved just to hear they're not dying or they're not crazy. The more you know about a medical condition, the more equipped you are to handle its ups and its downs. So this slide lists several sources of excellent and reliable information. Of course, we have to start with the CFIDS Association of America. Um, those people that have fibromyalgia uh, would benefit from a non-branded, non-advertising uh, fibromyalgia network. And for those who want to learn more about pacing and setting limits, coping with their illness, and obtaining ongoing support, Dr. Bruce Campbell offers written material, CDs, and even an online course that you can take. One of the problems that we've had, uh, and one of the questions that I get frequently is, where can I find this information all in one place? Uh, where is the information I need to manage this illness and understand this illness? And I, I've not been able to find such a program. So recently, uh, Bruce Campbell and I have teamed together, uh, and we're currently producing just such a website. Not ready yet. You're going to have to wait. Uh, but it is coming soon, and we're hoping that you will all find that as a uh, ready source for information and self-help. The second part of the uh, stepwise uh, is to talk about activity. And in this category, there are four aspects that I think are very important for you to understand. The first aspect is sort of a no-brainer. Exertion. Even normal, everyday activities make things worse, and if you overdo it, then you may trigger a flare that lasts for hours to weeks. Uh, this is what we were calling post-exertional malaise. On the other hand, if you just lay around every day, you'll get stiff and sore and deconditioned. So chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia is a balancing act. If you do too much, you get sick. If you do too little, you get stiff and sore and deconditioned. By positional aspect, I mean that there's something magical and there's something restorative about lying flat. Sitting and standing are difficult for you but lying flat makes you feel better. When people contract EFS or FM, it's as if the central nervous system becomes super sensitive to everything. You become sensitive to sound, you become sensitive to light. Um, you have a keen sense of smell so that odors are um, noxious perhaps. The temperature has to be just right. Uh, and some patients even get very sensitive to medications that they're taking. The least obvious of all of the four key aspects is stress intolerance. You may have noted that you get a little bit worse when you get emotional or when you have some physical stress, but you may not have noticed that mental stress, 
like reading or concentrating on paperwork or focusing on a computer screen are just as tiring as physical work. So for patients with CFS and FM, mental work is just as hard as physical work. And you have to take breaks during mental work, too. One of the first things that we teach new patients is to accomplish everything in small steps followed by rests. It's important to recharge your batteries two or three times a day. You don't have to spend a long time at it. 10 to 30 minutes is usually sufficient. It does help to get supine or at least semi-recumbent, say in a, in a recliner or lying on the couch with your head propped up just a little bit. That's because of the postural or positional aspect of this illness. And it's necessary to clear your mind because of the stress intolerance. So instead of worrying about what you're going to do or setting up your to-do list or um, watching TV or reading a book or talking on the telephone, it's much more important and it's beneficial if you're going to recharge the batteries that you do something that doesn't require a lot of concentration like praying or meditating or listening to music or falling asleep, all of which are reasonable. Now, until patients with chronic fatigue syndrome or fibromyalgia, that's what we call PWCs, or patients with chronic fatigue syndrome or fibromyalgia. So until PWCs learn to make lifestyle changes and set limits on their activity, there's a tendency to either push and crash or there's a tendency to not do anything at all for fear of triggering symptoms. So we end up with people who are roller coasters and we end up with people who are couch potatoes. The majority of the PWCs have difficulty slowing down their lifestyle. So there's a tendency toward pushing and crashing. And there is a real need for learning how to conserve your energy. So everybody is different. We all have different priorities, different goals, different limitations. And an activity plan has to be highly individualized for that reason based on personal tolerances and abilities. Exercise or activity should really start very, very slowly and increase slowly. Some experts suggest that the activity to rest ratio should be about one to three. For example, the person exercises for 30 seconds and then rests for 90 seconds. The initial goal is just to prevent further deconditioning, not strengthening or, uh, or cardio, if you will. A typical aerobic or conditioning program is not advisable. And so many times we hear that when patients go to their doctors, they've heard that exercise is a part of the treatment of fibromyalgia or chronic fatigue syndrome. Uh, and they recommend an aggressive exercise program. Um, or just as likely, patients will hear exercise and they think that they need to go out and join the gym or buy some equipment at home. It's not necessary that help with the activities of daily living first, hand stretches, sitting and standing from a chair, picking up and grasping objects, or just light stretching and strengthening exercises using only the body weight as resistance. Once these very easy exercises are mastered or well tolerated, then we might move on to stretchy bands like TheraBands or light weights. Finally, we add aerobic activities like walking or biking or pool therapy. I frequently use the concept of energy dollars to explain the concept of energy conservation. Spend any way you want. Every activity that you do has a small energy cost. So the goal is to end up with one or two energy dollars than you have. It's just like a little bank account. You have to make it at the end of the day or the next day. So if you spend too many energy dollars today, you uh, uh, resting tomorrow is the example. So uh, if you get up in the morning uh, and you brush your teeth and you comb your hair and you throw on some clothes, that uses up some of your energy dollars. And you may fix a breakfast um, that takes another energy dollar to do that. Uh, you may do some little errands or chores or putter around the kitchen, uh, and that uses energy dollars. So you can see how 
course of the day, you're spending this energy current, if you will. And once again, the goal is to end up with a little bit at the end of the night um, so that you have some time for yourself, for your family, or for your spouse. Now, many people with CFS and FM are reluctant to do any sort of activity or exercise because of a past experience and horror stories that they've heard from other patients that have tried to begin activity or exercise programs. And this is my most dreaded case. It's the couch or the bedbound patient. Evidence shows that you can and you must be active. Why do I say can? Um, physical therapist Lisa Clapp studied interval exercise in 10 patients who felt they just could not exercise at all. These were 10 patients who said that they couldn't do anything without triggering a flare of their chronic fatigue syndrome. And what Dr. Clapp did was challenge them to exercise on a treadmill, walk for three minutes on a treadmill, step off of the treadmill and rested for three minutes, then did three minutes on, three minutes off, three minutes on, three minutes off. They were able to do 10 repetitions on the treadmill or 30 minutes of exercise and not a single patient had a flare or a relapse on account of it. So even patients who don't think that they can exercise at all can do it if they do small enough steps. What's the evidence for must? Well, there were two large analyses of what we call meta-analyses of the literature uh, on the treatment of chronic fatigue syndrome, and those revealed two predictors of improvement. The first was a willingness to make lifestyle changes. Um, that is, adapt to the illness, accept the illness, and learning to cope with the illness, so learning those coping skills. The second predictor of success was a regular activity program. So you can be active and you really must be active in order to improve with this illness. But now the question comes up, um, are there ways that you can monitor how much you're doing and what's too much? And so what I'd like to do is spend a couple of minutes here talking about objective limits. So there are several ways to monitor your activity so that you don't overdo it or underdo it. The first two is invest a whole five dollars in a step meter or a pedometer, which you can get at Walmart or Target or any number of uh, sporting goods stores. Experience has shown that most patients with chronic fatigue syndrome take between a thousand and five thousand steps per day. So if you're under a thousand steps per day, you're probably pretty much of a couch potato and have to find something to do to increase the amount of activity in the day. If you're exceeding 5,000 steps per day, then you're probably overdoing it and you're going to have to find some way to back off a little bit. The second is um, to stay within the aerobic exercise range. At Hunter Hopkins Center, we frequently measure the anaerobic threshold uh, using a, a, an exercise technique, it's called cardiopulmonary exercise testing. And experience has shown us that patients flare when they exceed their anaerobic threshold. The anaerobic threshold is the point where your heart and lungs can no longer get enough oxygen to the muscles. And as a result, the muscles start making toxins like lactic acid and organic acids that seem to harm our patients. So once we use cardiopulmonary exercise testing to establish the anaerobic threshold, we can teach patients to limit their time um, to that period of time. So in other words, if your anaerobic threshold occurs at three or four or five minutes, then you won't exceed five minutes of exertion without resting for five minutes so that you can recover from it. Another technique is to limit the heart rate. Uh, we know that the anaerobic threshold always occurs at the same heart rate. So if we can establish where your anaerobic threshold is, or you can establish it by experimenting, then if you don't exceed that heart rate, uh, then you can avoid uh, overdoing it too. One last technique for monitoring your activity is to ask two simple questions. The first question is, how do I feel afterward? 
And the second question is, how do I feel the next day? So if you come back after an activity or after an exercise uh, and, and you're feeling sick or you're feeling tired or you have to lay down and recover, you've probably overdone it. Or if you do fine that day, but you wake up the next day and you find it hard to get out of bed because you're sick and malaise, then you've probably overdone it. And the rule of thumb is to go back and look at what you did and cut that activity in half. It's what we call the rule of 50%. So activity should not trigger post-exertional malaise. The next step on the stepwise approach is to talk about nutrition. There's no specific diet that's best for people with chronic fatigue syndrome or fibromyalgia, but experience has taught us that certain foods are tolerated better than others. For example, a diet high in red meat and fat causes lethargy and indigestion, abdominal fullness, and many other symptoms in our patients. Why? It's because red meat and fatty foods like fried foods and gravy are harder to digest than lighter foods, or simply stated, heavier foods require more energy to digest. So a prudent diet of fruits, vegetables, complex carbohydrates like potato, rice, and pasta, and light meats like chicken, turkey, and fish are tolerated much better. We have also learned that certain food groups and habits are not tolerated very well in CFS or FM. These are sugar, caffeine, alcohol, neurotoxins, and tobacco. And these five, these five uh, components are represented by the anagram SCANT, S-C-A-N-T. Now most PWCs crave sugar, and they do note that sugar can provide a needed burst of energy. The problem is that using sugar for a quick fix leads to hypoglycemic crashes and then the need for more sugar. So the sugar junkie finds themselves on a roller coaster of sugar ups and downs. Caffeine is also frequently used as an energy boost, but it too leads to a crash later on. Alcohol is not physically tolerated very well by most PWCs, and tobacco is simply unhealthy. So let's talk about neurotoxins, which usually refers to things like aspartame, MSG, which is monosodium glutamate, and the nightshade family of vegetables. Aspartame, which is otherwise known as NutraSweet, Equal, and other names, is widely used as a sugar substitute, but many people don't know that this purported natural product is actually broken down in the body to methyl alcohol and formic acid. Formic acid, or formaldehyde, is used as embalming fluid. And methyl alcohol is the highly toxic contaminant that can cause blindness and kidney failure. In simplistic terms, aspartame just adds more toxins to the overburdened patient with chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia. And, in our experience, leads to headaches and increased fatigue. Monosodium glutamate, or MSG, or just glutamate, is frequently added to, few, to food products to import that savory taste that uh, everybody likes to have. Although mostly associated with Asian or Chinese cuisine, glutamates can be found in many products like yeast or yeast products, bouillon, broth, pectin, any soy product, seasonings, and anything that's fermented. Neurotoxins like aspartame, MSG, and the nightshade family of uh, vegetables, um, they can cause a number of symptoms including headaches, nausea, fatigue, joint and muscle pain, abdominal pain and cramps, numbness, palpitations, even anxiety and depression. Do these things sound familiar to you? So try to reduce your intake of scant products but you don't need to avoid them all together. So if you want a little sugar, a little caffeine, maybe even a little alcohol from time to time, not a problem. It's the overuse that we're concerned about. Now I will mention lastly uh, that many of our patients are 
say dairy products and wheat or gluten. And if you suffer with abdominal complaints, consider four to five days of avoiding both dairy products and wheat. Wheat's our modified elimination diet, and copies are available from the office if you wish to give it a try. The next step uh, on the stepwise approach is to address specific symptomatic therapy, and this refers to therapy for sleep and pain and cognitive dysfunction orthostatic intolerance, and HPA axis abnormalities. HPA stands for the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis abnormalities. Of these four, no, make that five uh, different problems, sleep is probably the most important to treat. Now due to time limitations today, I'm going to emphasize sleep and pain therapies and if you have questions about the others, I'd be delighted to answer those at the end. Sleep management is really key to the improvement for chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia. And those of us who specialize in treating these conditions will tell you that that's really where we start the, the treatment. And it begins with simply good sleep habits. A common perception is that people with chronic fatigue syndrome and fibro sleep all the time. And while it may appear that this is the case, we do know that whatever amount of sleep that they do get is not restorative. So once again, it doesn't matter whether you sleep 4 hours or 14 hours, you're going to wake up not feeling refreshed. That's fairly typical for all of our patients. PWCs also experience fatigue achiness and mental fogginess that lasts for one to two hours after they get up in the morning, a phenomenon that we call dysania, D-Y-S-A-N-I-A. -A. Now sleep problems in these conditions include difficulty falling asleep, hypersomnia or sleeping way too much, frequent awakening, intense and vivid dreams, restless legs, or at night periodic leg movements, and sometimes what we call nocturnal myoclonus, or jumping and jerking in the bed at night. Simple sleep habits are the very first step of management, and they include things like establishing a regular bedtime routine, and especially a fixed wait time. Use the bed only for sleeping. Never try to make yourself fall asleep. It just causes anxiety. Hide the clock from view. We found that another source of anxiety was when patients wake up in the middle of the night and they look at the clock, it's 1 o'clock, they wake up, it's 2 o'clock, they wake up, it's 3 o'clock, they say, oh my gosh, I haven't gotten any sleep, and so the anxiety builds during the course of the evening. And if you have a problem like that and you're unable to sleep, get up and move to another room until you're really sleepy. But try reading or soft music or relaxation tapes. We found from studies uh, at Duke University, where we've had an ongoing study of patients with chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia, that using a computer screen or watching a TV at night is actually excitatory and makes it hard for you to fall asleep. Next, don't be afraid of insomnia. You'll do just fine the next day. And quiet resting is almost as good as sleep as far as restoring the body. And lastly, omit daytime naps. They just tend to interfere with sleep at night. Unmedicated sleep architecture is really the best approach, but pharmaceuticals may be helpful and they may be necessary. If you need pharmaceuticals, the first thing that I would consider would be over-the-counter sleep products like melatonin, tryptophan, and valerian, or maybe a simple antihistamine uh, such as diphenhydramine, uh, which is known as Benadryl, but it's also found in Tylenol PM and Advil PM and many over-the-counter products. Um, also consider doxylamine, which is available alone, uh, or it's the sleep agent that's used in NyQuil. If these are not beneficial, then start with a prescription sleep medication in the smallest dose possible and try to limit it to a brief period until your sleep gets uh, organized once again. In patients who have trouble both falling asleep and staying asleep, a combination that we found particularly useful is clonazepam or clonopin at a dose of 0.5 to 1 milligrams nightly. 
which is used to initiate sleep. And then to that, we add a low-dose tricyclic or tetracyclic antidepressant to help maintain sleep. So one is used to put you to sleep, and the other is to keep you asleep. An example of a tricyclic or a tetracyclic would be doxepin at 10 to 25 milligrams, amitriptyline at 10 to 25 milligrams, or our particular favorite, trazodone at 25 to 50 milligrams. Higher doses tend not to work as well and may be associated with side effects. The next step would be a non-hypnotic medication such as Lunesta or Rosarum or Sonata. These work naturally in the sleep center of the brain and they're not thought to be addicting, so they would be a good second choice. Hypnotic agents such as Ambien or Zolpidem are useful for both sleep initiation and maintenance. Zolpidem increases the depth of sleep, but users may adapt to it over time, and so it doesn't work as well the longer that you take it. And many users experience retrograde amnesia and parasomnias. By retrograde amnesia, I mean that there may be periods that you don't remember, and by parasomnias, I mean sleepwalking or sleep eating. The benzodiazepines, you may know them as Prosom or Halcyon or Ativan or something like that, can be helpful, but they're associated with a lot of unfavorable characteristics such as habituation, adaption, and adverse effects on stage three and four sleep. So we try to limit the use of these particular drugs. Analgesic or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, known as NSAIDs, can be used for pain, and when you control the pain, you can frequently control the sleep as well, because pain will wake you up from your sleep. Sleep and sedative medications produce their own problems and undesirable side effects, and judicious use of these medications is really necessary. So many PWCs are extremely sensitive to these kind of medications, uh, and if so, your advice is to start with really, really low doses and increase them gradually to tolerance. PWCs who are sleepy during the day might benefit from stimulant medications such as Provigil, Nuvigil, Ritalin, or Adderall to help keep them alert and focused during the day. And finally, studies have shown that up to 80%, let me say that again, up to 80% of our patients have primary sleep disorders like sleep apnea, periodic leg movements or restless legs, and narcolepsy. So if sleep is poor and it's non-responsive to medications, then seek the help of a sleep specialist. Let's move on to the management of pain. CFS pain originates mostly from the muscles um, and is described as a deep pain or a bone pain. Sometimes it comes from the joints, um, we call it arthralgias, and sometimes headaches, which are pressure-like typically. There's also a phenomenon which is called allodynia, which is a generalized soreness of the skin. So the skin just hurts to the touch. CFS and fibromyalgia pain can be improved with a regimen of stressing exercises and light conditioning. Uh, but as far as basic treatment, we think of non-pharmacological methods and pharmacological methods. Non-pharmacological therapies that are useful include things like hot packs or cold packs, using a TENS unit or electrical muscle stimulator, liniments or topicals like Bengay, DP, Icy Hot, Biofreeze, which is a particular favorite. Physical therapy has been shown to be useful and biofeedback. Pool therapy, we call aqua aqua therapy, and balneotherapy, which is um, hot tub therapy, uh, have been shown to be beneficial in these illnesses. And acupuncture and chiropractic have all been shown to be effective. Drug therapy for the control of pain is to be avoided if possible because of the possibility of habituation or addiction or adverse effects. Currently, there are three major categories of drug therapy, however antidepressants, analgesics, and anti-epileptics.
Let's begin with simple things like the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agents, or NSAIDs. These include aspirin, acetaminophen, or Tylenol, and ibuprofen. Uh, brand names are typically Motrin, Advil, and others. Secondly, low doses of tricyclic antidepressants like amitriptyline, dizipramine, and nortriptyline can be helpful and used to be the first drugs of choice. However, these particular medications, these particular medications are frequently associated with significant side effects like dry mouth, blurred vision, and weight gain. More importantly, they tend to work less well over time, and so they're being used less and less. More recently, NSRIs, which stands for norepinephrine, serotonin, reuptake inhibitors, have been shown to be effective for pain. They have fewer side effects. They tend to be weight neutral, and they're durable. That is, they remain effective after many months of use. These include drugs like venlafaxine or Effexor, Deloxetine, which is known as Cymbalta, and Mildasopran, which is known as Civella. Cymbalta and Civella have been FDA approved for the treatment of fibro pain. Epilepsy drugs have long been known to reduce atypical or neuropathic type of pain, like that deep, achy bone pain that our patients have. They are very useful in both chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia. The first drug of this type was gabapentin or Neurontin. More recently, pregabalin, known as Lyrica, has been FDA approved for the treatment of fibro pain. My next choice for pain control is tramadol, which is also known as Ultram, Ultraset, and Rizalt. This drug is in a unique class called an opiate slash non-opiate. Tramadol has the strength of codeine, but has fewer, re, uh, fewer adverse reactions, and it's rarely addictive. Therefore, it's very effective and more safe for PWCs than narcotic medications are. So if narcotics are considered, it probably is best to seek referral to a pain management program for the use of narcotics. But I want to talk about this a little bit um, with this diagram here, which diff which uh, illustrates different modes of central pain control. So first of all, if I can get you to focus on that leg in the lower middle part of the screen, suppose you have pain in the leg. That pain is sensed by uh, nociceptors or receptors in the leg and transmitted by the peripheral nerves to the spinal cord, which is that gray bar. It's represented by that gray bar on the right-hand side of the screen there. So pain is transmitted by the peripheral nerves to the spinal cord. In the spinal cord, there's a little junction box that connects the peripheral nerves to the ascending nervous system. And the ascending nerves carry pain signals to the brain. Now, medications like the NSAIDs or coxibs, that would be a drug like Celebrex or Mobic, for example, or topicals like your Engay or your um, Biofreeze or even something like Lidoderm and Lidocaine. They all work on the periphery there to reduce the pain by calming down those pain receptors. The opiates and the antidepressants, on the other hand, work in the brain and in the brain, they block opiate receptors uh, and reduce pain in that manner. The anti-epileptic drugs like pregabalin or Lyrica work on that junction box in the spinal cord and actually prevent the pain, it's thought, from getting up to the brain in the first place. There is another system. Uh, it's called the descending nervous system that acts on the spinal cord to inhibit pain signals from reaching the brain. This descending or inhibitory system is activated by medications such as Civella uh, or Cymbalta. In the past couple of years, researchers have been seeking new methods of controlling pain. One way is to use high doses of dopamine agonists like Requip 
or myrapex, which affect the limbic system and uh, the diencephalon or the midbrain. Another technique is to activate the microglial system of the brain using LDN or low-dose naltrexone. The microglial cells in the brain actually um, they inhibit the, uh, the central nervous system and inhibit pain signals. So the purpose for showing this little diagram is to point out that there are numerous ways to control pain and it may be worthwhile to use something like tramadol to affect the brain centrally, pregabalin to affect the ganglion, duloxetine or milnasopran to affect the defend, descending system, and it may even be worthwhile to add myropex or low-dose naltrexone so that you block pain receptors in a variety of ways. Well, I see that we still have a couple of minutes left here to talk, so I'm going to move on and just briefly ad address supplements and advanced therapies and theoretical uh, treatments. So first, a couple of comments about vitamins and supplements. First, I'd like to say there is no cure for chronic fatigue syndrome or fibromyalgia. The current state of the art of management of CFS and FM is to first manage lifestyle and second to manage the symptoms. If you don't adjust lifestyle first, you'll never get better. So let me be perfectly clear about this. Medications don't cure. The medications only manage the intolerable symptoms until nature does the healing. Now, people with chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia frequently become discouraged with the lack of a cure and the slow progress toward recovery in these illnesses. And for that reason, many succumb to misleading information about vitamins and supplements and nutraceuticals in an effort to feel better. Let's be honest. If these treatments worked, everybody would be getting better, and everybody is not getting better. The truth is, for every person who improves with alternative therapies, there are thousands who have failed to respond. So at Hunter Hopkins, we use two criteria before recommending any supplements. First of all, there has to be a scientific basis for their use. And secondly, a majority of individuals who use them must benefit. So based on these criteria, there are only about six supplements that we recommend on a regular basis. The first is high-dose vitamin B12. The second is vitamin D3, then lysine. NADH or maybe carnitine or acetylcarnitine, DHEA, and ribose. I have multivitamin, magnesium, and calcium at the top uh, because they do optimize health. And although they may not make you feel better, they optimize health and we include them on our list. The treatment of chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia doesn't end with lifestyle changes and symptomatic treatments. I don't want you to get that impression. There are also advanced therapies and theoretical treatments that are used. For example, the literature supports the use of growth hormone and low-dose cortisol in many patients with chronic fatigue syndrome whose hypothalamic, and fibromyalgia as a matter of fact, whose hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis is suppressed by their illness. That is, the hypothalamus, the pituitary, the adrenals, and other glands, like the thyroid and the sex glands, function poorly in our patients. And in such cases, the use of hormones and steroids may provide modest benefit for those patients. Some patients who suffer recurrent infections or viral symptoms may benefit from transfer factor or isoprinosine, which are thought to reduce viral load and possibly modulate the immune system. Lastly, Amplogen is an immune modulator that has been under study since 1988 for the treatment of chronic fatigue syndrome. The manufacturer, Hemispherics Biopharma, is currently seeking FDA approval for the use of this drug in chronic fatigue syndrome. Currently, though, it's an experimental drug, and it's only available at the Hunter Hopkins Center and Dr. Dan Peterson's clinic as part of an experimental protocol. Lastly, I'm going to very briefly mention that several well-known researchers have proposed, have proposed theoretical treatments for the management of chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia. 
none of these has been shown to be particularly effective in scientific randomized placebo controlled studies. In fact, they may only be helpful in a very small subset of patients. So my personal opinion is that they should be applied cautiously and only by physicians who are especially knowledgeable in their use. So this concludes the formal part of what I had to say in this presentation. I want to thank you all for your kind attention. I sincerely appreciate and hope that each of you has learned something new that will aid in the road to recovery from chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia. And now, if I can get Tim back on the line here, we can move on to some questions and answers, which is usually uh, uh, the most enjoyable and fun part of these kind of presentations. Kim, are you there? I'm here. Um, let's see. I'm uh, now trying to group some of these questions together because they uh, often um, overlap or people have asked about um, some of the same topics. And one question that came must come in about eight times was, what are nightshade vegetables? So if you had that question, I've put a list of nightshade vegetables, which include potatoes, tomatoes, eggplant, hot peppers. Uh, and things into the chat box at the bottom of your screen. That is absolutely correct. Look those over. I did a quick cut and paste from the internet. Um, there were several questions about sleep, and this is, uh, as we all know, um, just a perpetual problem for uh, individuals with CFS and fibromyalgia. Um, you mentioned not napping during the day, but if you rest during the day and fall asleep, that's okay. And somebody asked if you could just clarify um, what you meant about that. Absolutely. Um, generally, the sleep specialists tell us that napping during the day can have subtle effects on the depth of sleep at night. And so we generally encourage it. Uh, but there are many, many people who find that they can nap during the day and they have to nap during the day in order to restore themselves, in order to recharge the battery, so to speak. So if you find that a short nap helps you to make it through the day, then that's perfectly fine as long as it doesn't interfere with sleep. Now, while I'm thinking about it, um, I might mention that if you nap more than about 30 minutes, that phenomenon of dysania will creep in. In other words, if you nap or rest more than 30 minutes, you're going to wake up stiff and sore and sort of foggy headed. So that's why we usually limit nap periods to about 30 minutes. It's not necessary, but if you nap longer, you'll probably pay the price of stiffness, soreness, and foggy thinking. The other thing is uh, many people remarkably don't have to sleep um, as as much as they think that they have to, or, or nap as much as they think that they have to. Um, Bruce Campbell uh, told me a remarkable story about an attorney uh, who was napping three to four hours in the afternoon and very discouraged because she could get nothing done in the afternoon because of the time spent in bed. Um, and so he suggested that instead of napping for three to four hours, that she rest 15 minutes every hour. And what she found was that by resting like that, uh, she didn't have to sleep as much. So where she had been sleeping three or four hours in the afternoon, now she was resting 45 minutes to an hour, and she had two or three more hours um, in the afternoon that she could uh, use toward better benefit, if you will. That's great. Um, the dysania that you mentioned, is yes. there, have you found any helpful tips about how people can overcome that? That question was asked a couple of times. Y yes, um, and we all know it. You know, a cup of uh, coffee or some sort of caffeine and a jump in the shower is about the only thing I know that can jump start dysania. But uh, it, it's still pretty profound. E even if you do those sort of things, uh, it, it's sometimes difficult to recover. Many of our patients who have found stimulants helpful will actually take a stimulant medication uh, uh, first thing while they're in the bed uh, and allow it, because it takes 15 or 20 minutes for it to work, uh, they'll use the stimulant medication to help them get going in the morning. Probably the best thing that you can do is when you get up in the morning, get out of the bed and go to a chair or go to a recliner or the sofa uh, and, and just relax. Have a cup of coffee, watch TV, read a magazine, uh, do some uh, 
in bed exercises and stretching or something like that until it passes. But no magic in that department, sorry. And do you have any general advice about caffeine versus the use of other stimulants like Adderall and um, ProVigil? Um, I do, I do. Um, it, let's see, where should I start with that? I think probably the most important thing to say is that the stimulant medications do not work very well unless you are sleepy during the day. And there's a difference between being sleepy and tired. When you're sleepy, you have an overwhelming desire to close your eyes and lay your head down. When you're tired, you just feel sort of achy and low energy, and you know that you need to sit down and rest. So there's a difference. So what I'm saying is that people who are sleepy during the day and fall asleep watching TV or fall asleep while they're reading a magazine or uh, when they're riding in a car, they fall asleep riding in the car. These are people that would benefit from stimulant medications like Ritalin, Adderall, uh, New Vigil, Pro Vigil, that kind of thing. Uh, I have also found that people that get a big boost from caffeine, when caffeine is helpful, that they frequently respond to the stimulant medications also. So that's sort of a a test of whether you might respond or not. Many of my patients uh, will use a Starbucks uh, to uh, get some energy, uh, but others will do like we did in the college days and invest in some Vibrant or Nodos. Uh, and that sometimes works as long as you don't overdo it. That's great. Um, there are a couple questions about clonazepam and whether that interferes with slow wave sleep. Um, and whether it is okay to take long term. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, we don't see any problems with taking it long term, although many doctors are uncomfortable with doing that. So you may reach some resistance from your family doctor or even uh, if you have a psychologist working with you, they may be uncomfortable with it. But there really is no known long term um, disadvantage to using it. The point that I was trying to make is that low doses work very well to, to um, help you fall asleep because they reduce the amount of, of jerking, they reduce the amount of restlessness or, or periodic leg movements that patients have, um, and they tend to calm down the nervous system. So many people have that self-talk where you're, you're tired but wired, you're tired physically but the mind is going. That's what the clonopin tends to help. The problem with clonopin and the other benzodiazepines is as you get to higher doses, they decrease stage three and four sleep, which is the restorative sleep. So at small doses, they're helpful, but the higher the dose, the more they start to interfere with sleep. Very good. One, uh, let's see. One more question about sort of the morning phenomena. Is nausea in the morning a common symptom that you hear from patients? Nausea is a very, very common symptom, absolutely. Um, and, and there may be many reasons for it. I think probably the most common reason that I see is because the autonomic nervous system is affected in chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia. Um, and the autonomic nervous system controls how, um, it controls digestion, I guess is the best way to put it. What we see in many of our patients is a phenomenon where the stomach doesn't empty readily and the intestines don't empty readily and so they tend to fill up with saliva and fill up with gastric juices. And when the stomach gets full like that, it causes a feeling of nausea um, and it takes your appetite away, you know, a phenomenon we call early satiety. So the nausea is usually because the stomach is not emptying very well. The, uh, the simplest treatment for something like that is to use ginger, uh, and, and you, can, uh, you can get some ginger from the grocery store, ginger root, uh, and just shave a little bit off into some hot tea, uh, or you can chew on a piece of ginger root, or you can get some crystalline ginger. Uh, or if you're lucky, you can find ginger ale that's actually made with ginger and not just uh, ginger flavoring, but real ginger, and, and those can be helpful. Many of the health food stores sell ginger capsules or they sell ginger 
candies that can be helpful. Another thing that's very helpful for nausea in some patients is cinnamon. Um, and that can be as simple as dentine gum or some big red gum, uh, but cinnamon flavoring can be uh, helpful for our patients. Both of them tend to stimulate gastric activity and that's why they work. Um, for patients that have major problems, that is, they have regurgitation or they have uh, and actually vomiting, I hate to say that around lunchtime, uh, to actually have vomiting um, because the stomach just won't empty at all. Um, usually a, a medication called Reglan can be prescribed by uh, your, your doctor uh, and small doses of Reglan will increase gastric motility. While we're on that topic, a lot of questions about uh, gluten and gluten-free diets and D-ribose. Uh, okay, okay. About yeah, uh, both good topics, both unrelated. Um, gluten, of course, can be found in a variety of, uh, of grains. It is the, the healthy portion of the grain. It's the meat of the grain, if you will, uh, and it's found mostly in wheat but also in, uh, in rye and oats and barley. Um, so you have to watch those particular grains. Many of our patients who have diarrhea or who have gastric, um, I shouldn't say gastric, who have intestinal complaints, gas, bloating, diarrhea, cramping, that sort of thing, may find themselves sensitive to gluten. And I would recommend staying away from all gluten products for three, four, or five days just to see if it makes a difference in how you feel. The, um, the D-ribose is uh, a favorite product of uh, Jacob Teitelbounds, who's a good friend of mine, and he called me up one day all excited and he said, Chuck, Chuck, I found this new product that uh, is really helping our patients to feel better. D-ribose is a sugar, looks like sugar, tastes like sugar, uh, but it's involved in the production of proteins and energy, ATP, in the mitochondria and so some people who take D-ribose will find that they get a boost of energy. I think it's worth trying. You only need to try it for about two or three weeks. If you don't get a response in two or three weeks, you're not going to get a response. So it's not something that you have to, um, to obtain and then take for months and months to find out if it's working. So do you routinely or uh, occasionally test your patients for the formal test for gluten sensitivity or do you recommend more of a, a trial of a gluten-free diet and see if that makes any difference? Kim, that's a great question. Um, we do routinely test our patients that have GI problems like that and what we found is that the celiac panel, you know, a gluten sensitivity uh, or gluten intolerance is called celiac sprue. Uh, and uh, there is a test for that, but it's not a good test. It's not very sensitive, and we found that many of our patients have a normal test, but when they get the gluten out of the diet, they actually improve. And, and Paul Cheney and I showed this many years ago when we first started seeing our patients. They sounded like they had a gluten sensitivity, and so we would send them for the definitive test, which is to look down into the stomach and into the small intestine with a scope uh, and to see how thick the carpet of intestinal cells is. Um, normally those cells are long and if you look at the, uh, if you look almost microscopically at the intestine, it, it almost looks like a shag carpet. But in our patients and in people that have celiac sprue, the carpet gets very thin and, and sometimes the intestine looks even smooth when you look at it, which is abnormal. So this is what we found. Um, the long and the short is that we don't see a lot of classical celiac sprue, but we do see a lot of patients who are intolerant of gluten. I'd give it a try if there are intestinal problems at all. How about probiotics, Chuck? Probiotics are very, very helpful for our patients, uh, and by probiotics we usually mean things like lactobacillus uh, and bifidus. Uh, the current recommendations that we have, because they're so readily available and seem to be so effective, uh, are to use Activia, which is available at grocery stores, or Align, A-L-I-G-N, which is a probiotic that you can get at many health food stores and some pharmacies. Those are two widely used products. What they do is they recolonize the intestines with good bacteria 
and they tend to improve digestion and reduce a phenomenon that we call leaky gut. So yes, uh, the people that have digestive problems or intestinal problems, a probiotic would certainly be safe and worth a try. Great. Um, several questions about treating cognitive problems. And uh, are there exercises or regimen that you have found particularly beneficial for your patients? Cognitive difficulties are probably the most difficult that we have to treat, Kim. There really is no medication that helps with cognition that we're aware of, although a number of the Alzheimer's drugs have been tried in double-blind and placebo-controlled studies. Not very effective. Occasionally we'll find a patient that responds to medications like that, but uh, it's not something that we would recommend on a regular basis. For those patients who are particularly sleepy during the day and a big part of their cognitive difficulty is focus or attention or multitasking, um, caffeine or a, or a low dose of a stimulant medication might be helpful. But the main thing is that the brain is like a muscle and it has to be flexed on a regular basis to keep it uh, in shape, so to speak. And so the main thing that we have to recommend for cognitive difficulties um, is to use that brain. Do puzzles, do computer games, um, word games, Sudoku, things like that. Anything that you can do, even if you're, many of my patients I'll, I will send out to get um, children's books with word puzzles and, uh, and children's crossword puzzles, that type of thing, so that they can do them easily and have success with them instead of being frustrated and not able to do them. I, I've spoken again and again with our colleagues who are what we call neuropsychologists, the people that treat brain injury and cognitive deficits, um, and that's the advice that they give to us also. Uh, the other thing, of course, is to develop good habits. If you're forgetful, for example, and always misplacing your keys, what are you going to do? You always put your keys in the same place every day. If you're the kind of person that misplaces your car in the parking lot, then the habit to learn is to always park your car in the same part of the parking lot. Know where you leave it in every parking lot. So uh, developing good habits, uh, keeping paper around so you can take notes, uh, those are the things that we use to deal with cognition. I wish that there was more that we could do from a pharmacological standpoint, but there isn't. You mentioned at the very beginning of the program that you consider CFS and FM to be sort of brother and sister um, and have to have a lot of similarities. What are the differences that, that you think might exist, whether that's on a theoretical level or on a practical level um, in terms of the sure. guidance? Patient. Well, I mentioned a couple of them. I think the, uh, the first one and foremost is that if you do a spinal tap and you take fluid out of the central nervous system um, and study it, you'll see that patients with fibromyalgia have very high levels of neurotransmitters that cause pain, substance P, glutamate, BDNF, um, and, and there are others uh, that don't come immediately to mind, but they're usually elevated and highly elevated in fibromyalgia patients, whereas in chronic fatigue syndrome patients, they are not. So that's one difference, and, and it's that central sensitivity or that central pain um, magnification that's so typical of fibromyalgia. Now, patients that have chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia, which is the vast majority, it's like 80% of the chronic fatigue syndrome patients we see, they will have the elevated substance P and, uh, and so forth. Um, another difference is the genomic differences. Uh, many of our colleagues who are studying genomics find that there are differences between patients with only fibro and patients with only chronic fatigue syndrome. Um, I think the most practical difference is that patients with chronic fatigue syndrome, when they are exerted, when they embark on an exercise or an activity program, they tend to, to have more difficulty pushing that program. There's sort of a glass ceiling, and they tend to get sicker faster. Um, there are many programs with fibromyalgia patients where um, if you have pure fibromyalgia and not much, not much confusion, not much fatigue, 
um, those patients can be exercised pretty rigorously and do well with it. But as soon as that brain fog and as soon as that, uh, um, that fatigue gets in there, then our patients do less well with exertion. So those are the things that come mostly to mind. That's, that's great. And uh, I would echo your observation about the post-exertional. Um, post-exertional malaise, right. Right. Being, being sort of a cardinal difference between people who seem to have primary, primarily one condition or the other. Correct. There were numerous questions about the dysautonomia and uh, treatment of dysautonomia. And I'll mention um, before I give you a, a chance, I know we're running over time and you probably have patience this afternoon. Um, but we have Dr. Peter Rowe uh, coming to do a webinar, or actually he's not coming anywhere. He's staying in his office too, like you are, uh, <laughs> doing a webinar on, on managing orthostatic intolerance uh, on September 7th, so that's quite a ways away, but we have a, a lot of information on our website about that, so I'll make sure to include that in the uh, follow-up email, but if you want to take just a second and talk about your approach to uh, managing orthostatic and dysautonomia issues, that would be great, Chuck. I'd be delighted, sure. Yeah. First, let me say uh, that the autonomic nervous system is very frequently affected in patients with chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia. It's one of those overlap disorders that we talked about early on. And the autonomic nervous system controls all of your automatic functions, like your heart rate, your blood pressure, whether you sweat, whether you get goosebumps. Uh, it controls pupil size. It controls your runny nose. Uh, it controls swallowing. And it controls digestion, urination, and even defecation. So it controls all of those automatic things that you don't have to think about. So. Um, when the autonomic nervous system goes awry, like it does in chronic fatigue syndrome, patients get a wide variety of symptoms from night sweats to unexplained goosebumps to uh, blurred vision, uh, difficulty accommodating from far vision to close vision, uh, trouble swallowing, so you might strangle on foods from time to time. Um, we mentioned the, the gastroparesis or the slow gastric emptying is a big problem. Even constipation might be uh, uh, controlled by the autonomic nervous system. Most of the symptoms that are associated with the autonomic dysfunction are nuisance symptoms. They, they don't cause any major issues, although they are very annoying. Uh, and unfortunately, there's not much that we can do about them. The, the two that we worry about most, um, the first one is a fast heart rate. The autonomic nervous system causes a, an elevated uh, heart rate, uh, probably because it stimulates the sympathetic nervous system, um, but it causes a fast heart rate. And sometimes that leads to heart awareness or heart pounding or, or even uh, palpitations of the heart that are very uncomfortable. And so if that's an issue, uh, we can use a medication called a beta blocker to slow down the heart and prevent that kind of pounding or uncomfortable feeling. The other one, which uh, Peter Rowe is going to talk about, I think you said in September, um, he's going to talk about orthostatic intolerance, which means low blood pressure. Uh, and it's the pressure that's controlled by the autonomic nervous system. So um, there's a wide variety of problems that we see there. Um, some people just have low blood pressure but no symptoms with it. Some people get dizzy and, and see stars or they get tunnel vision if they get up quickly or if they stand in place. Uh, and even others will actually faint uh, after standing up for just a couple of minutes. That's what we call neurally mediated hypotension. And it's an autonomic problem. Um, that's the one that we worry about the most because if you have orthostatic symptoms, in other words, if you get a lot worse when you're sitting or standing for just a short period of time, then the nervous system is probably lowering your blood pressure and making your symptoms worse. And the best way that we have to treat that uh, is to increase the amount of blood volume by drinking lots of fluids. Um, and by drinking lots of fluids, we're talking about a half a gallon a day for most people. That's 64 ounces. That's eight glasses or that's three of those bottles of Gatorade that you would get at the Circle K or the, the Sam's Mart or whatever you have locally. Uh, 
so it takes lots of water, uh, but the water won't stay in unless you take salt with it. And so it's important to get an extra five or six grams of salt a day. That means about a teaspoonful of salt. So the only thing that I would mention, the, the only warning I would mention is if you have high blood pressure, obviously you don't want to force water and salt. But if you have a low blood pressure problem and you have those positional problems uh, where you get dizzy or faint if you're upright, um, then try volume expansion with lots of fluids and extra salt. If that doesn't do it, there are many medications, which I'm sure uh, Peter will discuss in September, uh, that can be used to, uh, to solve that problem. That's great, Chuck. Okay, I'm going to ask you one more question and you're one more free question to okay. it's free to say it's time for my patients <laughs> uh, we're doing fine several folks ask uh, what your thoughts are about XMRV and other viral uh, cause slash triggers of CFS yeah and I'll, I'll uh, note also uh, Cindy Bateman will be with us on July 15th for a webinar with an XMRV update and Cindy has been involved with a study that's being done at the University of Utah by Dr. Ela Singh who is one of the uh, discoverers of XMRV so uh, I hope you those of you interested in this topic will join us back on July 15th so not too far away, which is uh, which is good. So uh, let me give you my take on the XMRV situation. Um, you, you many may recall that years ago, and I'm talking uh, late 1980s, early 1990s. It was the discovery of a retrovirus in patients with chronic fatigue syndrome that brought me and Paul Cheney and David Bell together in Charlotte to do research on retroviruses. And unfortunately, we had the difficulty then that not much was known about retroviruses. AIDS had just been described in 1983, and there weren't many tests, and there weren't many people that knew much about it. And so um, following Hurricane Andrew in about 1992, when we lost a lot of our samples, we also lost a lot of our funding for studies on uh, the retrovirus. And uh, I think that, that the possibility of a retrovirus being related to chronic fatigue syndrome sort of was shelved for many, many years. Recently, of course, Dan Peterson and his group uh, out in Reno recognized that there was a virus the xenotropic murine retrovirus, or XMRV, that was known to increase an enzyme called RNA-L. And they found that very, very interesting because one of the chemical abnormalities that we see in patients with chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia, uh, much more so in chronic fatigue syndrome, by the way, that's another biochemical difference. Uh, but patients with chronic fatigue syndrome tend to have very high levels of RNA cell, and, and so it encouraged uh, Dr. Peterson and his group to look at this virus and see if it was present in patients with chronic fatigue syndrome. Well, the rest is history. You know that they took 101 specimens and 67 percent of them grew the virus or had evidence of the virus in their blood. Um, and uh, when other tests were done, about 97 percent of those 101 patients had evidence that they had had the virus now or at one time. So the question stands, how is this virus related to chronic fatigue syndrome? Is it a virus that causes chronic fatigue syndrome, or is it saprophytic in the sense that it just likes people that have chronic fatigue syndrome? Is there something about the immune system or something about people with chronic fatigue syndrome that this virus particularly likes? And that's a question that we, can, we haven't answered. The, the sad thing right now is that there have been a number of studies by other groups that have not confirmed the XMRV virus. Uh, I think most of us would agree that they use different techniques and they weren't able to identify the virus. So I know that currently there are studies underway using the Peterson technique or the, Peterson, the Whittemore-Peterson technique um, for examining this virus. And I think in the near future, um, we will know a little bit more about this virus, um, whether it does 
whether it really is associated with chronic fatigue syndrome or not. That still leaves more questions, though, because currently there is no known treatment for the XMR virus. There have been some anecdotal reports that AZT is helpful, uh, but no one knows if other treatments are available. So um, I know, for example, that Hemispherics Biopharma uh, is interested in studying um, whether that's the reason that amplogen works. Uh, and fortunately, they have specimens from patients before they were treated with amplogen and after they were treated with amplogen, and they're hoping sometime soon to study those specimens to see if the amplogen actually got rid of XM. RV in the patients with chronic fatigue syndrome. And I know that there are drug companies in the United States who are interested in studying drugs that treat XMRV. So there's a lot of work to be done. Uh, the big question that I get every day is, should I be tested for XMRV? And, and my answer is, no, I wouldn't do that right now um, because we really don't know what the association is or if you had that virus, is there anything we could do about it? Um, but Kim, I think it'd be appropriate at this point to mention the biobank um, that um, patients from my practice and Peterson and Dr. Gluckman and Dr. Bateman um, who have been diagnosed with chronic fatigue syndrome um, who were interested in supplying a specimen of their blood uh, to, the, to the new biobank, which is a blood and tissue storage bank, um, that would be highly appreciated, and uh, it's likely some of that will be used for XMRV studies, or at least possible. Yeah, if you'll pass the controls over to me, I do have a couple slides about the biobank, and Suzanne um, that would be will, great. Be, will be giving a, a webinar uh, specifically about the biobank with Dr. Liz Horn from Genetic Alliance. Um, so uh, another plug, and that webinar is on June 8th, but as Dr. Lapp mentioned, on March 29th we announced, we announced the biobank, and um, if I had not been in Washington, D.C. for the last two days, I'd be able to tell you how many patients we have enrolled and how many blood samples we've received and how many questionnaires we um, are up to, but it's very exciting. Um, and right now, just for the purposes of the initial enrollment, we have limited the enrollment to um, Dr. Lapp's patients, Dr. Bateman's patients, Nancy Klimas' patients, and Steve Gluckman's patients as well. Um, and we are trying to ramp up quickly so that we can expand that beyond that group of patients. Um, this is a, a collaboration partnership with Genetic Alliance, which is a, an organization that creates frameworks and tools for organizations like ours to um, more directly participate in and facilitate research. And we made very careful uh, selection of working with Genetic Alliance um, and mainly found that their patient privacy and security standards uh, were among the best in these, these types of uh, partnership opportunities. So. Um, We've just had tremendous response from the community, and I think the only downside has been that we had to uh, limit the diagnosing physicians to just four to start out with. But I think that's going to be an easy challenge to overcome as our, resource, uh, our resources ramp up, and that's uh, staff resources and money. So uh, supporting our research program will help us be able to accelerate the expansion of the biobank. And those, were actual, those are actual tubes of blood from the very first uh, person who got their tube sent in. And um, it's very exciting. The lab that collects the specimens for us and processes them uh, sent us a little picture the first day they got some tubes back. So those are actual biobank tubes. Um, just to point out a couple other things uh, that have come up, here's some URLs. And I'll make sure that those go into the uh, follow-up email that we'll be sending out within the next day or so to let everybody know that the slides from today's presentation are available and up on the website and also the recording of this program. Um, we still have 164 people on the line, which is just amazing. And um, 
that's just great. Um, so I want to uh, thank Dr. Lapp. And My pleasure. I've gotten so many positive comments in the little message box. It's hard. I'm like, oh, great. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> and uh, one person wanted to be sure that um, we relayed his or her. I won't uh, make any divulgence about the gender of this person, but that everything that you said works. Uh, they were bed bound until uh, seeking your, your help, and now. She, uh, he or she is back to work part time and actually has a reasonable social life. Um, so that's our goal. That's your goal, and I know that you've helped many people to achieve that. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to give the presentation. Thank you, Chuck. And if anybody wants to stay on the line, I, I was going to um, just pass on some news about an event that I was at yesterday. Um, in Washington, D.C., so anybody who, who has gotten their fill and uh, needs to just shut down for a little bit, I won't be disappointed if folks start to drop off, and I'll certainly let Dr. Lapp get back to his busy day and, again, express our gratitude for taking time out of your busy schedule to, to be with us this afternoon. So yesterday um, on Capitol Hill, with collaboration from three other organizations uh, that represent patient groups. Um, trying to, let me just take a second and fix this. I'm on a slow computer today, and I'm a little weary myself from a, the trip. Um, oh, goodness. Not cooperating but I did want to share this information for anybody who's interested in hearing about it. Uh, well, we'll just do it this way. Yesterday uh, in Washington, we la launched the Campaign to End Chronic Pain in Women. As I mentioned, this was a collaboration of four organizations, the CFIS Association of America, the Endometriosis Association, the TMJ Association, and the National Vulvodynia Association. So in addition to uh, me, these three other women who are leaders of their respective organizations uh, had an event on Capitol Hill with some financial support from Pfizer to launch a campaign uh, that has both policy and media components documenting the fact that up to 50 million American women suffer from poorly understood and neglected chronic pain conditions. And these six here were actually just the uh, six that we used in terms of developing the report that was released yesterday. But there are many others that could have been included in this list, including uh, migraine, irritable bowel syndrome, rheumatoid arthritis. Um, so the six that we specifically looked at are chronic painful conditions that affect women more often than men or affect women um, and not men, such as in the case of uh, vulvodynia and endometriosis, although I learned yesterday that there are some men with endometriosis. Um, these conditions combined, just the six listed here, add as much as $80 billion to our annual health care bill. And this is certainly an issue that we at the CFIDS Association have been pushing on the Hill and in meetings like the uh, CFS Advisory Committee for several years. But it was um, particularly impactful to combine efforts with these other groups and to really demonstrate um, sort of the cross-diagnosis impact of all of these conditions. Um, and what we also documented in terms of a report that was released yesterday is the disturbing pattern of neglect, dismissal, and discrimination that women in the healthcare setting with these disabling conditions face that also impacts on men who get diagnosed with these conditions because then they suffer the double stigma of having a quote unquote woman's condition um, and you know get a, a different sense of uh, trivialization and dismissal in the healthcare system. But this particular report focused um, much more uh, intensely on on how women are treated in the healthcare system with respect to these conditions um, using documentation of cardiac 
uh, disease and, and other things that are less subjective and more objective, where women still get a completely different treatment uh, than men do and uh, are treated less aggressively and more often um, even heart disease is written off as anxiety or panic attack when um, it's actually a heart attack. So we compared and contrasted those things. Um, and also showed that because of the perceptions about these conditions and the gender issues that come up in the healthcare setting, that women are routinely misdiagnosed, shuffled from office to office, inappropriately treated, and left without answers or hope. Um, so this was the theme of the presentations that were given and the uh, patient testimonials. Um, and one of my favorite pages in the 40-page report that was released yesterday and is now available on the website is this one here. And I don't think it will come as a shock to um, anyone, male or female, um, about the impact of all these different factors on uh, women's care in our society. Um, we had an event yesterday morning at 10.15 on Capitol Hill in the Capitol Visitor Center, which is, by the way, a beautiful building. I had not been in it before. Um, the event was sponsored by the Congressional Caucus for Women's Issues. Uh, let me correct myself. The, the right verb is in cooperation with. Um, there are all these rules about what verbs we can use. So in cooperation with the Congressional Caucus for Women's Issues, um, we actually had a standing room only situation. As you can see on the bottom left, uh, the room seated 60 people. And because this was sort of the first time out with this group of conditions and this uh, point of, of the entire event, we weren't sure how many people to expect. And we ended up with uh, probably 75 to 80 people crowded into the room for a one hour event, which is uh, really quite amazing given the uh, number of things that are going on on Capitol Hill at any one time. Um, after we left that one hour event, um, the eight of us, uh, one person had already left by this time of the day, uh, went on and did 11 meetings on Capitol Hill with the Representative Pelosi staff, Senator Reid staff, uh, Congressman Waxman, Congressman Plone. We basically focused on the um, leadership of both the House and the Senate for committees that have uh, a hand in health care reform in particular and appropriations and authorizations more generally. Um, and just had a very successful uh, and busy and um, energizing day of meetings up on the Hill with some great uh, support and interest and enthusiasm for the way that the goals of this campaign align with the implementation of health care reform. Um, so we'll be uh, excited to continue bringing everyone news about that. And later today, we'll have a copy of the press release and some of the other photographs from the event um, that will be sent out through our CFIS link emailing list. So hopefully you all get that free publication. And we've had a couple extra issues this month because there's been so much going on. But um, I encourage you to visit the website here at nwomenspain.org where you can find the um, really well detailed and documented report called Chronic Pain in Women, Neglect, Dismissal, and Discrimination. Um, also, a, a short film called Through the Maze, Women in Pain that um, really resonated with the audience there yesterday. Um, you know, very powerful, very impactful stories uh, from real women with these conditions and what they have been through, um, as well as the policy recommendations that we have documented and talked with members of uh, congressional staffs about yesterday. So you'll be hearing more about this from us, and um, I'll make sure that this URL is included in the follow-up message as well. So having gone way over our time and really uh, stress the limits of, of how much people can uh, take in a, in a webinar setting. I will close it out here and thank everyone for attending and certainly for hanging on uh, all the way to the bitter end here. And um, just appreciate the support of the community and the enthusiasm for this webinar series. Um, we will have this recording hopefully up on our website and our YouTube channel within a few days, um, and also a copy of Dr. Lapp's annotated slides up on the website. And you'll get those URLs in your follow-up message. So uh, look for that to come in.
again, thanks to everyone. And we'll look forward to uh, being back with you on June 8th at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, Eastern Daylight Time, with Suzanne Vernon and Liz Horn, who will talk about the biobank. So uh, have a good afternoon, everyone. Thanks, and take care.